Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 7 of my 8086 assembly programming tutorials. This is basically going to be the last one for a while because we've covered most of the commands in the 8086 instruction set. We've kind of missed one of the best ones though because um, we've not looked at the string commands. Now if you're familiar with the Z80 you will know the LDIR command which um, will copy a bank of data from one area to another. And strings are similar to that. They basically allow us to copy areas of data, fill areas of data, and even search them. So we're going to have a look at them today, and we're going to learn how to use them. Now, the string commands themselves actually only do a command a single time. If we want to do a command repeatedly, we have to combine them with the repeat command rep or rep nz or rep z, that kind of thing. So um, they're a bit unusual, or at least they seemed a little bit unusual to me the first time I saw them, but they're very, very powerful. And these are what the SI and DI registers are used for. We've sort of seen them before and they've been described as source and destination, but it wasn't potentially very clear why they were called that or what their real purpose were, and they were intended for these string functions. Now, depending on the command we're using, the registers that will be applicable will vary. And because the source and destination may not be even in the same segment, we're actually using two different segment registers as well. So here's just a brief summary of each of the commands. We've got the compare s command, and this can work at the byte or word level. And the source will be the data segment, si, source index. And the destination will be es, the extended segment, di, destination index. And this is for comparing. It will repeatedly compare bytes of memory so that we can compare two strings or two bit blocks of data. And that's something I should really be very clear on. Although these are called string, they don't just work on text. They work on all byte data. So um, that's the first one. Now we have the load command. This will read in a byte from memory. Um, so this comes from DSSI here. We've got move. This will transfer entire blocks of memory. Um, it doesn't actually move them. It leaves the original there as well. It's not like it's zero in the original source or anything. But yeah, that copies from DSSI to ESDI. We've got scan. That's for searching if we're looking for a particular byte or word. And that just uses ESDI as the destination area to scan. And then we've got a store command, and this will just use ESDI, and AX is the source. It writes a single byte or a single word repeatedly. As I say, all of these commands can be used at the byte or word level, and we can use them all with a repeat if we wish. Um, we would typically want to. The repeat will run CX times, but um, you can do these one at a time, like the LDI command on the Z80 if you wish. Okay, so we're going to go over all of these with some practical examples again. Let's go over to our source code. And let's see them in action. Okay, so here's our first example. We're going to be trying out the store commands here. Now, first we're going to try the move command, and then we're going to try the store command. Now, the move command will copy from a source area to a destination command, and the store command will store just a single defined byte or word. Now, all of these have two direction options. The source can be the start of a, an area, and then we copy in ascending order, or it can be the end, and we copy in descending order. And th this is what the direction flag is for. If we clear the direction flag, then we will be going in ascending order. If we set the direction flag, we're inverting the direction, and we're going in descending order. So we'll have a play with both. Now, with regards to this test, we've got some source data. We've got that just here. So we're going to be using this as our source, and our destination is just 16 zero bytes here for us to do copying and things. When we're doing compares, we're gonna be using some different data. Uh, it's almost the same, but some bits have been blanked out so that we've got something that's changed. And we've also got some search data, which we'll be doing some other searches for on later. So we'll be seeing those later on, just thought I'd show them all at the start, yeah, so everyone knows what we're dealing with. So we've got some functions to show the strings and things. Uh, we're loading in our source and into the source index and our destination into the destination index. The DS and ES segments are both being pointed to the current segment just here because it's just a test. And first of all, we're going to be moving at the word level and we're going to be repeating. And we've got CX set to three here. So let's fire this up and let's see what happens. So here's our commands. Now we started here and CX was three. CX has now depleted to zero because we've copied our data. You can see the destination index has gone up here and the source index has also gone up. Now here was our source data and here's our destination data here. Now we used the word command here and so you can see one, two, three words have been transferred here. So that's what's happened there and it's of course this data just here has been transferred from the source to the destination. 
Now, let's try some of these other options. Now, if we flip the direction flag here and run again, well, you can see the same data range. Now, this was the first byte again, because that was the source index. But then after each write, the destination index has gone down. So we're actually writing backwards here. And so you can see the data has transferred in the opposite direction. So those are the move commands with the word setting. But we can also do this at the byte level. As you can see now, we've just copied one byte there, a second byte there, and a third byte there. So again, we can do this at byte or word if we wish. Now, of course, we can change this. We change this to seven. We've now filled a much larger area, you see, because as I say, it's the CX that's defining the count of how many times we do this. OK, so that's the basics of how we can use the move command to transfer bytes and words in either direction from the source to the destination. Now, as well as being able to move bytes and words, we can also store fixed values. Now, here we've got a fixed value of 1122 in AX, and we can use the store command. We'll just change this back to three for clarity. And this, in, instead of reading from a source memory area, we'll just be writing the same bytes over and over again, or the same word over and over again. Let's fire it up. Well, here you go. Here you can see we've filled this one, two, three times. Two, two, one, one. A uh, little endian, of course, so that's reversed of that. You can see that's been transferred there. Of course, we did that at the word level, but if we wish, we can do it at the byte level. Now, of course, because that will only use AL, the top byte has been ignored. So we've just filled two, two, three times here. And that looks just fine. So that's a, a great way of filling data ranges if we need to. Uh, of course, as well, we can use these move ones if we need to actually copy data ranges. It's nice and fast, it's very simple, and it's just a, a single command or a pair of commands, just depending on how you look at it. So, yep, that's the basics of the store command. And that's really, uh, uh, strings are a little bit confusing, maybe, the first time I saw them, because there's so many commands in, and registers involved. You've got to set your DS, your ES, your SI, your DI, your, your CX, and maybe even your AX. It's a little bit confusing, and with the repeats and things, but uh, fundamentally they're very very powerful and they, they get a lot of done in a single command so um, let's say they, they are worth knowing about um, although you, you may not need them for simple things okay so that was copying and filling data this time we're going to do a compare so we're specifying the same source data but this time we're going to be using some compare data as a test here now again we can compare at the byte level or the word level and we're going to be repeating and with zero here. Now what this says is repeat so long as the zero flag is set, so long as the source and the destination match, you see. There's a repeat Z and there's a repeat non Z. So here we're going to keep repeating scanning until we find a difference. So we're going to try this at the byte level in ascending order. We also need to specify a limit for the maximum number of searches to do. So we're going to search nine times. Now the, the, the search will end if we find the result or if the loop counter reaches zero. OK, let's fire this up then. OK, so our starting point was just here with this one, two here. So we scanned one, two, we scanned three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the difference was here. Now, what we can actually do to just confirm where the loop ended is if we just remove that and then if we set this command here, now you can see we've actually written an FF after the loop ended here. Now the way it works, it, it's a little bit strange. Uh, it seems a little bit strange to me anyway. Um, this is the first byte that's different, but by the time the loop ends, the, um, the, the destination index is actually pointing one along because it's been incremented for that last check. So DI was actually pointing to this byte here, although it was this byte that was the first one that didn't match. So that is how it works. Now we can just do it the other way around if I just put this STD in here. No jokes, please. OK, um, now you can see here this time, this was the first byte that didn't match because 00, zero does not match 67. And so the marker has been written just here. So you say we can scan here and we're scanning at the byte level. We could also, of course, scan at the word level. Let's just give that a go. Well, um, this time we're all the way over here because, again, this word matched this one. 
This word didn't match this one, but by then the word count had already moved back up to here. So that's where our marker has ended up. It, it seems a little bit strange to me, but as I say, that is the way it works. So um, it's just what we have to deal with. Now, if I just change this back to the byte pointer again, and this time I'm just gonna set CX to just two this time, and we'll fire it up again. Now, oh, I said CLD still, it doesn't matter. So this was our first check here, and that matched. This was our second check, which matched here. Now this was our third check, and before the right, this would have matched as well, but the loop counter reached zero, and so the loop ended before we found the difference. Now we can actually just, um, if I just change this to 100 here, and run again. You can see in this case, the um, CX hadn't reached zero, and so you, so we can tell that we had actually found the correct result, whereas if CX has reached zero, then we didn't actually get the result before we ran out of searches. Okay, so, so that's how we can do this. Now, all of these commands make most sense with the repeat command in most cases, but we don't have to. We can just do a single compare if we want. All of these commands can be done without the repetition, um, like the LDI command, if you're familiar with Z80, you've got LDIR, which is load increment repeat, and LDI, which just does one load increment. Now, this can be handy if you want to transfer data from a source to a destination, but you want to do a bit of extra thinking in between for some reason. For example, if you were um, writing bytes of data for, to a screen from a bitmap image in memory or something, maybe you're doing some other effects to some of the bytes or something. But anyway, as I say, generally speaking, I think they're gonna be most useful with repeat command, but the point is you don't have to do them. So here, because we didn't do our repeat, uh, we just did one scan here. The destination has moved down here, which is why our marker's here. And CX hasn't changed at all because there's no repeat occurred that time. Okay, so there we go. Now that's the compare command, which will compare two strings. There is also a scan command, which will search for a single byte or word. Okay, so this time we're gonna scan a string. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for a particular byte or word pattern. And once we find it, we're going to stop. So we're gonna be using this SCASB, which is scan string for a byte, and we're gonna be looking for hexadecimal 11 here. Now, we've got two options, repeat NZ, which will repeat until the, the byte is found, or repeat Z, which is repeat while the byte is found. So re repeat while matching or repeat while different, so to speak, with, the, with regards to the Z flag. So here we're going to be looking for hexadecimal 11, and we're going to write a marker of FF into the data once we find it. Now, again, we've got our counter set nice and high to eight so that we will definitely find it because, again, the repeat will only occur until either the match is found, until the flag is zero or non-zero, depending on the repeat command, or CX reaches zero. So in this case, what we've done is we've scanned for a byte, which is hexadecimal 11. We've started just here again, and we've started scanning along here. And of course, the byte will have been found at this point here. Again, the marker has been put in with DX higher because DX increments after each scan. So this was our point where we found the byte we were looking for. Now, alternatively, we could do this same command in the same, in a different way. If I change this to 2, 2, and then change this to repeat while 0, and I run again, well, we've got the same result in a different way because this time, rather than scanning for 1, 1, we've scanned for the first byte that isn't 2-2, two, because two, AX is now 2-2, two, two, you see. And so we've ended up with our marker just here. Of course, again, if our counter is too low, if we just put our counter to one here, well, now we're not gonna scan far enough at all. So uh, we, we've run out of checks before we've actually found the difference we were looking for. That's being done at the byte level, of course, like all the other commands, we can do these at the word level, but of course these can be done um, backwards as well. So this time we're going to scan, we're gonna to have to scan a bit higher this time, and we're gonna be looking at the first word that isn't 2222 here. So we've started scanning here, that matches. We've scanned here, that matches. We've scanned here, that didn't match. And um, as before, the destination has already been moved after this scan, so the destination pointer is pointing just here, and that's why our byte marker FF has been written just here. And so we're able to scan strings here with those commands. Okay. So those are the sort of main string ones. Now this one um, seems a bit odd to me. I have not used it programming, but um, basically it's a string command, but it will just read in a single byte into AX. Now, I believe you can repeat this, but I'm not 
clear why you would want to. It doesn't really seem a command you would need to. I mean, being able to read in quickly bytes from a source string makes a lot of sense, but repeating loading into AX, I, I can't quite see where you'd want to do that um, unless you had some memory mapped hardware or something and you were needing to actually sort of um, inactivate the ports. But I really can't see why you'd want to repeat this. But anyway, um, what we're going to do here is we're going to do a few tests. We've got some test data. We're going to repeatedly read in bytes and show the result with this function here. And then we're going to repeatedly read in words. And again, we're going to be using the source index like with our other string commands. Okay, so here's our test data, which we've seen all too many times, we're probably quite bored of. So here, our first command has read in a byte. It's read in 0, 1 here. Here's read in another byte. It's read in 2, 3. Here's read in another byte. It's 4, 5. You can see the counter is unchanged because we've got no um, rep. You can see the source index is going up as we read in each time. And after we've done the three byte reads, we've done the three word reads. So you can see we got up to four, five here. So the next one has read in six, seven, eight, nine in little endian here. There it is. And then ABCD has been loaded in here. And then EF12 has been loaded in here. So again, uh, we can do this at the byte level or the word level. I say I believe we can do this as a re repeat, but yeah, we can compile that. I, I don't understand it. I don't know why you'd want to do that. If you can think of a reason why you'd want to do that, please let me know. Anyway, as I say, you can do it. I can't think of the reason you would want to, but um, there we go. Another command available to us should we need it. Now, the last command we're going to be looking at today, and indeed in this current um, phase of these tutorials, is the translate command, which uses a lookup table. So I've got this really simple lookup table here. It's just got a series of bytes with both uh, nibbles of the byte being the same number here. Now what translate does is it basically looks up from an address we specify, and it uses an offset and then reads in the data from that. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to show the data to the screen. We're loading the data segment to point to that translation table, and we're loading the translation table address itself into BX here. Now, what we do when we do this translation is we will read in a byte, AL, and we'll read it in from the segment DS address BX plus AL. So essentially, we're kind of converting a byte via a lookup table with this single command. This would have been fantastic to have on the Z80 for doing transparency and things. So. Um, that's what that's what it does, um, and we're going to just um, do it here. We're going to do it a few times, and we'll just see the results. So, basically, whatever value we have in a, in the low part of AX here is being looked up in the lookup table that's being specified by DS colon BX here, you know, DS segment memory address BX, and then we're reading in. And because of the way my translation table works, um, it's basically converting a single nibble to a matching pair of nibbles. Of course, if the table was different, then it would have a different effect. So uh, if I change these to being letters, like um, I could change this to a zero here, and I could change this to a one, a two, and so on, I, that, that'd be enough. Well, now you can see we're converting um, numeric values to ASCII values. So very nice command there. Um, Again, I mean, it's it's one you could um, you could program yourself. You know, you could create the um, lookups yourself if you wanted. But um, a fantastic command to have available to you. So yeah, there we go. Now that's actually the end of the series. Um, I'm not covering any more on the processor itself. If you've liked these, please like and subscribe and that kind of thing. Because um, if enough people enjoy this series I will look at doing the um, 386 later on and things like that but at the moment um, I, this is as far as I was planning to go because I, I was only interested in this system as a retro system as a bit of a curiosity I am not planning on teaching how to create x86 games so we're going to be continuing programming on these 8086 systems but we're now going to go into the simple series and the platform specific series where we're going to learn how to assemble hello worlds draw bitmaps to the screen and read in from input and things like that so uh, we're done for the processors but we're not done for the 8086 so please stick around if you want to see more 8086 but whatever you do I, I hope you found this curious I hope you've enjoyed it take care now thanks for watching and goodbye